Hello and welcome to our webinar, Using Digital Tools to Assess Talent. I'm Paul Michaelman, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of the live event. We welcome your questions for our speaker today. To submit questions, please enter them anytime in the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel. Or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREvent. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. If you experience audio or other difficulties during today's program, please follow the instructions in the questions module. Our speaker today is Tomas Chamuro Premzik, Chief Talent Scientist at Manpower Group and a Professor of Business Psychology at University College London and Columbia University. Our thanks go out to SAS for their sponsorship of this webinar. Tomas, we're looking forward to your presentation and the screen is yours. Thank you, Paul, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I think the main focus of today's session is to examine some of the um, exciting innovations and technological developments that have been happening for about five or ten years in the space of talent identification. And what I will try to do to begin with is to set the context and understand how uh, we got to the time and point in time and space where we are today, where these innovations are being considered by organizations. Um, but I think it is important to make the transition from older or more established tools that have been deployed in the so-called war for talent and uh, understand the potential uh, value, incremental value or ROI that new developments and new innovations uh, can bring to organizations. But let's start with a poll, a survey for our audience, which I think will give us a sense of um, the degree to which organizations have uh, successfully crack this issue of the war for talent. So how good is your organization at identifying and attracting the right talent today? And you can select one of the following options, excellent, better than average, about average, below average, or very poor. Please submit your answers now. Tomas, any predictions on what will be the leading category? Um, I am afraid if I give some predictions, I might <laughs> not or bias responses. So let's see. Good answer. The prediction is there will be some answers first, and let's hope that is the case. Here we go. Okay. So we can see a representative or at least very rational audience because about average one in psychology we often talk about the better than average effect whereby most people think they're better than average at most things which is statistically impossible here we see actually a pretty clear normal distribution interestingly just three percent excellent and also three percent very poor so we can see now how this aligns or um, how this mirrors some of the things that we have found in our research and the wider um, kind of um, population of talent management. So we can return to the presentation now. Okay. And I think the context for what the discussion today is this idea of the war for talent, a notion introduced about 20 years ago by McKinsey and Cole, um, this idea that in the future, the main competitive advantage of organizations would come not from their business ideas, the industry they were in, uh, their processes, uh, or even their IP, but um, from their ability to manage people, in particular to attract uh, the right talent. I think 20 years later, although this idea is has become um, almost commonsensical, so much, so much so that it is almost a cliche, in fact, when somebody tells us that people are their biggest asset, it almost certainly means that that is not the case and that they're just repeating something because it sounds good. 
Um, but I think we can take a look at how we are today in general uh, in the war for talent. And there are several indicators that suggest that there is still a lot of progress to be made. For example, we know that a large proportion of the workforce is not engaged with estimates varying. But uh, if you look at data, for example, from Gallup, they have estimated over the past 10 or 15 years that about 70% of uh, employees are either disengaged or not engaged at work, despite unprecedented amount of money spent, not just on engaging people, but on giving employees consumer-like experiences. And bear in mind, this is based on data from some of the most successful and biggest companies in the world. So you can imagine the average reality is worth for, worse for most employees. We also know that um, a large number of uh, people with jobs, even within the knowledge economy, so highly skilled employees or workers, uh, are considered passive job seekers today. So, for instance, LinkedIn estimates that about 70% of its 450 or so million members uh, are, um, if not actively looking for alternative jobs, passively waiting or hoping for better job situations. We also know that even in places where the economy is strong and job opportunities abound, more and more people are deciding to work for themselves and self-employment rates have been increasing over the past decades. And equally, more and more people um, decide to ditch traditional employment altogether to try to become entrepreneurs and the startup activity is up in places again where opportunities are very very good and strong for especially qualified people so what we can see is that in general our ability to not just identify but manage talent is far for optimal of from optimal of course some people are some organizations are leading the way here but at the same time for the average employee um, work or careers or jobs are not experienced in a very positive way. And instead of boring you with data, you can just, you know, look at what people are saying about their jobs. Um, I think if some of the monies we are spending on improving uh, careers and work experience for people were better spent, the reality will be very different. And we will be talking about really a war for talent rather than a war on talent, which is what we seem to have today. And especially if you think about where monies are being spent um, mostly, which is at the top in leadership identification and development interventions, and yet the average uh, experience that employees get from their managers, direct line supervisors or leaders is uh, not congruent really with all the money we're spending. Equally, even though we are speaking about HR having uh, the potential to contribute strategically to the growth of businesses, which makes total sense if most organizations have problems that have to do with people and HR is qualified to understanding people, that's where their solutions should come from. And yet HR departments still don't have a good reputation, neither with employees nor with their leaders. If you look at service such as this one from HBR, where executives uh, have to rate the degree to which they think their company is being effective, at attracting top talent, we can see worse, um, more negative um, perceptions or figures from the ones that uh, we saw with the audience poll that we had at the beginning of this presentation. So even in places like North America and Australia and New Zealand, where talent identification is more scientific than in other areas, only 20 or 29 percent of executives think that their company is doing a good job at uh, that, at attractive talent. So basically, I think this is important because the bar isn't necessarily very high right now, which uh, makes the case for at least trying things differently or using different technologies and different uh, methodologies and tools to identify talent. 
And fundamentally, I think, although we often think that there is a um, structural or um, inherent tension between the degree to which um, organizations knowing their employees and, and employees knowing themselves can coexist, it is important to understand that solving this fundamental crisis of understanding where organizations don't really understand their talent, their people, and people actually don't understand themselves very well is for the mutual benefit of both parties. Um, so I think this is where technology and innovations can add uh, really important value, helping organizations understand their employees and also simultaneously providing feedback that helps employees understand themselves. Unfortunately, the main reason why this hasn't happened with established or new tools is that we still overrate our intuition more than we should. And, you know, to be sure, there is a small percentage of managers, leaders, or employees who are intuitively able to judge talent in themselves and others, but the majority of people um, are not as intuitive as they think, and yet they make decisions on gut feeling. Even today, when we talk about a data-driven world and certainly data-driven management, um, the biggest enemy that data analytics and data-driven tools have is that people would still rather trust their instincts than hard facts. And if you think of how most managers truly judge and rate potential or talent today, uh, intuition is the number one currency. I know it when I see it is what they say. Uh, if you ask them even, how do you know if somebody has potential or talent? Equally, if we take a look at the tools that are uh, or the methodologies that are still almost universal across industries and across different businesses, uh, we can see how much room there is for improving the fact that it is still almost impossible to get any type of job without going through an interview and it will mostly be an unstructured interview that we know is not very reliable or predictive of future performance and which invites people to project their own biases and um, hire people like themselves um, no matter how much unconscious training interviews go through, it's impossible to ignore the fact that in front of you, you have somebody from a specific socio-demographic group, that the person in front of you is male or female, white or black, young, old, rich or poor. And yet we still rely on this methodology to identify talent internally and externally. Then if we look at the prevalence or ubiquity of things like the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs indicator, um, which has almost cult-like or a horoscopic following, and uh, people love to talk about whether they're INTJs or something else, but uh, um, there's very little you can predict, very little of value in terms of performance or future employee behavior that you can predict with an assessment that is mostly used because it tells people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And the fact that we judge performance mostly through subjective ratings from an employee's direct line manager, whether it's nine box grid or otherwise, and these type of data are contaminated, polluted by politics and subjectivity. So we need to really find ways to overcome our intuition and AI will help us do that to the degree that we can get better data on potential and performance. So we need to find more prevalent and uh, predictive signals that can help us quantify an individual's future performance and their potential and their talent. A really good book I recommend on this subject is Prediction Machines by Ajay Agarwal and colleagues, where they make the very compelling argument that really AI, which in our field in HR and management is mostly still machine learning algorithms, um, is best understood as cheaper prediction. And when the cost of something goes down, adoption goes up, and uh, we will soon get to a point where AI will almost be commoditized and do itself. So the biggest competitive 
uh, advantage or differentiation will come from actually having data, data that can be used uh, to make predictions and to drive decisions, and really the expertise to translate the information uh, in that data into, um, um, uh, into useful knowledge. So if you think about it, we're going to talk about the new type of signals that have appeared in the last five or ten years. We really have three components in the process, people, data and prediction, to the degree that new tools can help us translate our access to people into data or datify people, prediction will happen more and more often. So it's datifying people or translating human behavior into data that presents the biggest opportunity for overcoming our intuition and improving talent identification. So that's the uh, field we covered in our recent uh, MIT Sloan Management Review article with Josh Bersin. We talk about new ways in which organizations are leveraging technologies to gauge employees' talent and potential. And uh, before this article, we published an academic review with some of our colleagues uh, on what these new talent signals are and the degree to which they are shiny new objects or really represent a brave new world that will turbocharge organizations' ability to understand people and predict performance. So what are these innovative talent tools? And I think the best framework or concept to understand what these tools do is that they are providing us with new signals or indicators of individuals' potential, of individuals' talent. Let's think about these tools also as technologically enhanced versions of things that have existed before. Uh, the easiest way to understand this or the clearest example of this is digital interview platforms such as HireViews. Um, in a world where we still love to interview and where interviews tend to be time consuming and expensive and still require a lot of resources and mobilizing different people, interview platforms or digital interviews enable us at least to capture data in a more efficient and uh, scalable way where uh, the hiring manager or recruiter can simply post questions and then those questions are administered in a standardized way in the same way to all candidates which increases the reliability then there is the issue of how those answers are actually being evaluated or vetted if we still have um, human managers looking at these interviews and deciding whether somebody has potential or not then we won't eliminate intuition and we won't really reduce the subjectivity of this methodology if um, these platforms are developing algorithms that are designed to predict the preferences of human interviewers so you train a model to detect or predict whether somebody will get a pass or a job offer from human interviewers, then again, we won't eliminate bias. In fact, uh, when algorithms or AIs are accused of being biased, which is nonsensical, what we really mean is that they have been trained to predict biased outcomes, which is the subjective opinions of humans. So there's huge opportunity here to deploy uh, these technologies in a, in a more predictive and fairer and more ethical and legal way if they target not people's impressions or perceptions of an interviewed candidate, but the candidate's actual future performance. Then we will even be overcome the biases that exist in current uh, um, analog interviews. That uh, plat platforms such as HireView and similar technologies also enable us to capture speech or voice data, um, which is much more predictive than people think. There's four or five good scientific articles showing that the physical properties of speech of the human voice can be linked to both um, uh, perceptions of performance, for example, in customer ratings or sales jobs, we can um, link speech properties to um, uh, customer satisfaction ratings and even sales transactions. 
Uh, so some voices are more likable than others and some uh, uh, features of speech can be decoded to predict this and even objective group level or unit level performance uh, data. So for example, studies have uh, linked the uh, speech patterns and really not so much looking at the content of speech, but the context of uh, speech and physical properties to uh, business unit performance. So some business leaders uh, have, um, well, business leaders differ in their type of speech and voice and those differences uh, can be reliably linked to indicators of the business performance. Equally, we know that we can translate text um, data via uh, linguistic uh, natural language processing and other kind of uh, models and frameworks and software. The words that people choose to use and the frequency with which they use those words in their digital uh, communication, so for example, email, which is the data that companies have the most, uh, can be translated into uh, personality data, into competencies, into ability indicators. We've known this for a while, so since the 60s or 70s, for example, we know that the number of times that people say I and other self-referential pronouns is indicative of their narcissism level, or that uh, people who use more complex and sophisticated or snobby words tend to be more curious and open to new experiences and tolerant ambiguity, uh, tolerant ambiguity more, and they're also smarter. Equally, a lot of research has mined activity from social media. This is actually the area where we have most scientific research, so independent peer-reviewed journal articles, especially by uh, Michal Kozinski and his colleagues have shown for the past four or five years that we can translate social media activity, uh, the things that people like on Facebook, the things that people say on Twitter, uh, etc., into reliable indicators of that person's personality, competencies, abilities. And although there's not much work linking these data to future performance, we know that if things are a good proxy for personality and intelligence, they will probably predict future performance. And uh, work done by um, uh, Ben Weber and uh, his colleagues out of uh, MIT and the MIT spin-off uh, has shown that social sensing, monitoring uh, where people go, what they do, who they talk to in organizations is indicative not just of uh, group level dynamics and social networking, but could also tell us something about the degree to which people are more entrepreneurial, more curious, uh, the degree to which they are pro or anti-diversity, the degree, degree to which they are inclusive or not. And finally, the area that is uh, covered uh, uh, quite extensively in actual uh, hiring or recruitment, in particular in the pre-hire market, gamification attempts to increase or improve the candidate experience by either shortening the assessment process or making it more fun or at least less boring. Uh, most gamified tools are understood as situational judgment tests, so they give people different scenarios and they can choose, but there are also examples of behavioral uh, or uh, simulation uh, activities, both in uh, the cognitive space with companies like MindX uh, gamifying IQ tests and Pymetrics gamifying impulsivity or risk-taking tasks. For example, uh, you are told that you're presented with different balloons that inflate and you have to stop the balloon from inflating at some point. The bigger the balloon gets, the more money you earn, but if you go over the top and you let it inflate too far, it blows up and you don't make any money at all. So these are again tasks that mostly have been used extensively in the context of neuropsychology or clinical or psychological research. Technology can now help us deploy these at scale. And I think we're just scratching the surface. Uh, if you think that most individuals in the world are now connected to the internet and that most of them have a significant fraction or portion of their digital reputation scattered around the web, you can think of a future in which all these signals uh, of individuals' behavior can be translated into valuable elements or 
components of their reputation, including their potential or talent. Research backs this up, so we know, for example, that the movies that you like or that you watch on Netflix say a lot about your personality, whether you're a sensation seeker, if you watch a lot of horror movies, whether you're curious, if you watch a lot of documentaries, the music that you listen to on Spotify and the music that you pretend to listen to when people ask you says a lot about your identity, your preferences, your values. Again, you can translate musical preferences, not just into personality, but also IQ. Your Uber rating correlates strongly with your emotional intelligence. I always say to people, you know, if, if your Uber, Uber rating is below 4.4 or 4.3, you're probably quite disagreeable. You probably have a, a grumpy predisposition and a lower EQ. If it's above 4.8, 4.9 is the opposite and so forth. So to the degree that we can deploy uh, this information in an ethical or legal way, and it is a big if, then you can see um, us moving to a world where not just technology and these apps understand people better than organizations understand them, but maybe even people understand themselves better than they're understood by potential and current employers. Historically, if you think about this um, transition from uh, IO, industrial organizational psychology, to the world of AI-based talent identification tools, I think the main difference is that historically, um, industrial organizational psychologists or IO, which owned this space, cared mostly about accuracy. And that's, of course, very important. If a tool is not accurate, if it doesn't predict future performance, then there's no point in deploying it. But there was a, a unidimensional focus on accuracy. Does it work or not? People didn't care, not just the scientists developing these tools, but also organizations didn't care about the time it took to put a candidate through it, didn't care, care much about cost, which is why uh, traditional assessment has had a very low penetration in the market. If you think there's something like 40 million assessments used in HR and talent identification every year and 400 million um, people working in the knowledge economy and 4 billion people working in the world, then you can see that these traditional science-based tools, and some of them are not even very scientific, um, have been used only in 1 or 10% of the cases. And we didn't care about the candidate experience either. We did care about ethics, which is something that new tools need to be thinking about very, very seriously. So now I think we, we have multiple evaluation criteria to judge whether tools work or not. Accuracy is important, but there's also how quick they are, how cheap they are, what the candidate experience is. And there is a tension between all these factors which are also moderated by ethics. So, for example, you can have a really, really cheap and quick tool that is fairly accurate, but maybe is not ethical because, um, you know, there is a difference between what it enables you, uh, you know, what you can know and what you should know about candidates. So, uh, scraping people's data or using data from social media or the wider web is an example of that. Um, equally, if you want to create the world's most accurate tool, uh, it will probably take too long for people to go through it, for it to be implemented at scale, cost a lot of money, and the user experience will be very poor, even if it is ethical and so forth. So I think ethics are important. Um, in the world of uh, marketing and increasingly financial services and insurance, and especially if we take it to the extreme of discussing, for example, a social scoring system such as the one introduced by the Chinese government where people's data and ratings of the general population are being considered for uh, credit scoring. But I think also in the world of HR and talent identification, we need to be aware of all the data that could potentially be used and that are available. So what you can see now is just one um, it's like one very, very simple um, uh, screenshot of Facebook data without including even uh, personality or psychological variables here. So just the demographic segmentation 
for a few subjects on Facebook and the amount of data that is produced even by moderate users. Um, so, you know, I think it is important to think about this fact that today there is a big difference between what we could and should know about people and what the ethical implications are, even if we can master the issue of uh, accuracy and if these tools end up having comparable predictive validity or accuracy uh, to establish scientific methods. So what are the ethics of tools that are quite snoopish, that are uh, creeping behind our back and gathering information and turning that information into um, indicators of our potential or future performance without our awareness? To what degree is it ethical to withhold feedback from uh, candidates or potential candidates, if we're calling them part of the pre-hire market, if we're scraping their data and not telling them what is being done with their data or what that data says about themselves. So do we want to promote information asymmetry here where a recruiter or algorithms know more about the candidate than the candidates know about themselves? Or could we use some of these technologies to democratize feedback and help people understand their strengths and limitations better? What about bias, especially in the case of using these tools to predict biased outcomes? They can often confer in cases like the one I described, if we are um, training algorithms to predict the uh, ratings of supervisors or the ratings of human interviewers, then it is clearly a case of garbage in, garbage out, and biases that are already there in place will be augmented or maximized by making the process faster, more scalable, and more efficient. But ending up with more bias than we had in their beginning. And to what degree do we need to move beyond black box models that are just predictive without being explanatory, without actually uh, explaining why there is a connection between certain input um, variables and certain output variables? So these are questions that should be asked. We don't have the answers to all these questions right now even from a legal perspective, but it is uh, also um, a matter of ethics, and that's really what is at stake when we are evaluating these new methodologies. And especially if you think about where the field could be going, there are things that are not yet deployed in uh, talent identification, but that are potentially um, uh, useful at least or predictive. For example, the more data we gather on uh, face recognition and uh, face scraping uh, and, and the more we know that the signals that can be not just collected but also analyzed by algorithms say things not just about a person's uh, preferences, attitudes, personality, but also uh, their sexual identity and their religious beliefs and maybe the degree to which they are uh, risky to insure or risky to hire. Um, we know from psychological research that most of the competencies that employers are interested in are based on dispositions such as character or personality traits that have a genetic component. So if you think about all the data that are being gathered uh, by companies such as 23andMe and other um, uh, kind of uh, DNA profiling and genetic uh, makeup um, profiling companies, um, it is uh, not yet used by HR professionals or in talent identification, but these data are being gathered and they are somewhat predictive of future performance, including leadership potential and leadership performance. And some of you may be familiar with the, the nose dive episode of Black Mirror, where essentially it depicts the dystopian scenario of us living in a rating society where everybody rates everybody else on everything. We're actually not that far off from this. Um, most of the apps, and especially social networking apps, but also other consumer apps, restaurant bookings, and people doing reviews on Amazon, etc., or Uber, as I mentioned, involve rating each other. Those ratings are probably indicative of people's 
likability, their social skills, their drive, their self-control. So you could also ask to what degree uh, is it okay or acceptable to use that data to identify the right person for the right job or top uh, talent. So these are questions that need to be asked. Uh, I think at the end of the day, a lot of the uh, short-term advantages in talent analytics will come from organizations using internal data because that goes gets past some of these legal constraints and also some of these ethical concerns. After all, employees are supposed to be working in organizations and therefore the data that they uh, produce there sh should and could be used to identify their potential. So what are the main implications um, of all of this if we continue to move this way? Uh, the first, uh, as said, is the use of internal data. The second is the uh, potential to move towards a talent on demand or uberization of talent model where um, it is uh, at least quicker and more efficient for companies to source uh, talent using information that is already available on the potential talent pool. So imagine shifting to a world where most people don't need to be assessed because they have, to, they have been assessed already, or we can easily translate their data into an estimate of potential. Then, uh, you know, I think uh, on the upside, this has the potential to make the job market or the labor market more efficient. The labor market is still far less efficient than other markets. There's still a big gap between supply and demand. If you think about the US today, there are 7 million job vacancies for 6 million job seekers. Uh, better assessment or talent identification tools won't completely uh, bridge that gap and eliminate this mismatch between supply and demand, but it can certainly take care of some of it because there are jobs that people could do and they don't know that they could do them and there are people that could do jobs that employers are not aware that they can do. I think uh, problematic implications of this is the prospect that this will uh, increase inequality. And this is a very interesting and somewhat paradoxical issue that you can make the system more meritocratic and yet inequality rises and social mobility decreases. Um, so the poor get poorer and the rich get richer, but at the same time, I think it is uh, feasible to expect that the poor still get richer because there are jobs that most people can do right now and they're not aware that they can do them. And uh, identifying talent is not so much about finding the best people, but, find it, but about finding the best jobs that people could do. And uh, to some degree, talent is really about person job and we can do a better job on that. More apocalyptic takes on this have been um, presented, for example, by Yuval Harari, who talks about uh, how the increasing uh, penetration of AI and automation in the workplace will create a class of uh, useless individuals, so the rise of the useless class if it continues in this way. So I think that's more on the negative or pessimistic um, uh, attempt. And uh, I think the more optimistic uh, and, and simplistic view uh, of this space and what it could potentially do is that there is really a big promise here and a big potential to, um, to um, merge or at least find a synergy between science and technology or to deploy the science of assessment at scale by boosting our understanding of people and help people understand themselves better so which would mean that companies should at least be able to source talent in a in a cheaper quicker and better way so if you want to read more about that uh, i've written about this in my latest book the talent illusion and I think now we have time for questions. Thank you very much. Paul, over to you. I'm, uh, I'm with you now. So okay, thank, thank you. you for that great presentation. And we're going to move now to our Q&A. We've gotten a lot of great questions. And we will continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour. A reminder that you can submit your questions by entering them into the questions module or on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMR event. So, Thomas, we've had, we've had a great cross-section um, of questions, but a lot of them 
have been around bias. And you spoke um, quite a bit about bias and the risk of bias and how bias now is almost being collected or centralized, potentially, if we don't mitigate it, mm-hmm. in the few people who are creating the algorithms versus dispersed across all the various humans um, who were doing this, um, who, who, were, who were assessing catalogs, uh, who were assessing talent in a more, um, well, analog way. So how, as we're looking at these new tools, as we're looking at um, AI-driven um, solutions to help um, supplement the hiring and talent evaluation process, how do we know which ones have been properly vetted? Do we need some kind of governing body that puts a good housekeeping seal of approval on new technology? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it would be great to have some regulation and a governing body, I think, for um, established or traditional assessment tools, that governing body has been the independent community of academics, and which is why tools uh, have generally been more trustworthy and reputable if their data has been published in independent scientific journals. You know, it's too soon to actually uh, expect that from some of the novel tools, but I, I one should expect the same level of standards. And failing that or until that uh, body of evidence is uh, available, I think trying things internally, pushing these new vendors and these new technologies to demonstrate accuracy while minimizing or even eliminating adverse impact, bias, et cetera, is something that at least large organizations who can benchmark existing internal employees or leaders uh, are able to do. It is harder with a small firm, and but with bigger organizations that is the case. And I think you know most of these technologies and new vendors want these type of clients because they can also um, result in case studies that actually demonstrate accuracy and absence of bias, bias to the wider market. I will say though, Paul, that if, if only we had the same level of scrutiny and the same d- demands uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating human biases, because that's the biggest problem. Most of the biases that exist are still humans, and it seems that we don't care about that. We're okay with bias in interview process, we're okay with bias in supervisors rating employees, but here comes AI or new technologies, and we assume, oh, they're biased, and therefore we shouldn't use it. Well, maybe they are biased, but they're still less biased than human. Um, so, and that's a great point, and, and a point that you you made during the presentation, and um, and in your article for MIT Sloan Management Review as well. But the the reality is today we do believe in our own I- intuition um, over um, any kind of um, externally generated, computer generated result. And there have been a lot of studies that indic that indicate even when we're faced with incontrovertible evidence that an algorithm is arriving at superior results, we still prefer a process in which we have a direct hand. How do we overcome that, or do we just have to accept that, and as we think about using these tools, find ways for the humans who are relying on them just to be comfortable with them? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's, to some degree, it, technology needs to make the case for itself and needs to prove with results that it can do a better job than human intuition. It's just, and this is a fascinating issue, it's just that we really rate our own intuition much more strongly or more highly when what's at stake is judging or evaluating other humans. We're actually much more self-critical or humble when it comes to vetting other products. So I think, for example, most people today accept that if they travel to a new city or new country, asking TripAdvisor or some more niche sites where to eat, where to sleep, or crowdsourcing at least uh, people, the collective knowledge of people is, is better than trusting themselves. I think same with using Google Maps. Uh, same with deciding um, what movie to watch or what product to consume. But with people, I think it's the last barrier uh, the, where we will question our own intuition. And of course, you can still develop great expertise with the help of data. I think in the next few years, we're still going to see uh, a transitional period where humans aided by AI technology and data will 
be better judges of people, including their talent and potentials, that, than humans uh, working without data or without AI, and AI even working without humans, which is why if you think about using these tools to identify executives, CEOs, or leaders, is still relatively unheard of because it's very um, small number of decisions that are very high stakes and where you still have a lot of time and money to combine longer tools with human expertise. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at bias um, from a slightly different angle now, um, as um, several people um, in our wonderful audience have asked us to do. Do the existence of some of these new tools themselves present a problem of bias? In other words, let's look at um, gamify. Let, let's look at the gamification um, and assessments in which people are um, are engaged in, say, arcade-like um, experiences. Do these tools um, inherently um, give advantage to people who are comfortable and familiar with these types of environments, and do they present a hurdle to those who are not? So, you know, and 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 I really think that is that is a, a a question that is not as important as whether having an advantage in um, I think there's two two things that are more important, Paul. The first is like, do people who score higher or perform better on these tools actually perform better on the job later on? And then the second one is is uh, a high score on these games or tools confounded with certain demographic characteristics, be it race, gender, age, that could enable organizations to pretend to hire for A while actually also hire for B, C, and D, which would then result in a less diverse workforce or an even adverse impact, bias, or you know, illegal kind of recruitment. I think that is, so the issue of whether, um, you know, why some people are better at the game or not is, you know, the assumption one can make, even if there isn't a clear explanation and the algorithms are black box, that if performance on the game correlates with future performance on the job, the game is tapping into some relevant job, relevant competencies, attributes, or qualities that are desirable. Now, it's, there's a way to demonstrate whether this is the case by also correlating performance on the game with established benchmark measures of those competencies, personalities, intelligence, traditional assessments. So this is where I think moving beyond prediction onto explanation and understanding not just that A relates to B, but why it relates to B uh, will make the process more ethical. That's interesting. So is there any risk that these tools will isolate on individual characteristics and individual performance too much? I mean, after all, in an organization, it's sometimes very difficult to isolate what an, in, you know, it, an individual from the surroundings and from the team and the group that they're participating in. How do these tools help mitigate against that? Well, so absolutely, you know, everything, anything of value happens as the result of collective um, performance or, you know, uh, group efforts. And uh, it, it's hard enough to predict individual performance to predict group level performance and the interactions with people is a lot harder, but you need to start from the individual, right? So the example you can think of is if I wanna create the ideal soccer team or any team sports, uh, I need to be able to understand the interactions between different players in different positions. But to do that, I need to first understand what the individual's talents are and their predispositions and their values. So individual uh, selection is a means to achieving a synergistic uh, you know high performing unit um, there are two ways in which we can move beyond the individual to preempt or predict some of the collective interactions or synergy one is if you're ben benchmarking existing current existing high performance in a specific team or culture, then the context sort of absorbs the elements of the group or the unit, right? So if I'm trying to emulate or mimic the qualities that a high performing team member or leader has in a context, I can assume that I am selecting for that environment, for that culture and for that context. And the second one is to actually look for 
a healthy level of cognitive diversity, not get all people who are the same, but much like you don't want all defenders in a soccer team or all strikers, you want a combination. And for that, you still need assessment. So what changes is the what am I looking for, the how do I find it stays the same, but you really have a more, uh, you know, a bigger focus on team composition rather than just saying, okay, right, all high performers are like this, so I'm going to get all clones of each other. So you can still allow for differentiation, even if you still use the same process, the same tools, and the same algorithms. Where is there risk, if any, um, that some of these new tools can be gamed? And I think um, um, one of our viewers asked specifically about uh, data mining and social profiles. As it becomes widely understood that companies are analyzing our public personalities, mm -hmm. you know, can can smart, I'll give them that credit, um, uh -huh. can, can, can individuals kind of get ahead of that and start creating profiles with the pure intent of being attractive to employers? How do we, how do we see through that? Yeah, so, so yes, everything can be gained, uh, even though things like social media scraping uh, seem attractive because you think, wow, you know, they're less gameable or less fakeable. Of course, they can be gamed. And who will really argue that, who would generally argue that um, the person we portray on Facebook is the real version of ourselves, the authentic, unfiltered version of ourselves, rather than one that is utopian and uh you know uh, let's say 20 or 30 percent more successful than our real self and that's true for all social media outlets but you kind of alluded to the issue if the ability to game these uh, algorithms and to fake good or game the system is indicative of being smart astute politically skilled and a number of other positive qualities then Gaming is not a problem. You actually want to hire the people who can game the system. And this applies also to traditional assessments, right? When I, if, if you ask somebody in an interview or in an assessment, I enjoy working with others, and they say no, that person is being honest, but you probably don't want to hire them. Now, among the many, many people that say yes, we could, um, we could expect some of those people to be lying, or faking good, but guess what? The ability to do so correlates positively with the ability to pretend to work well with others in the future. So, you know, the issue is not whether people fake or lie, but whether they stop lying in the future. So long as you continue faking or lying, the ability to fake these algorithms correlates positively with the ability to manage impressions um, with your boss, with your employer, and so forth. So uh, we have to move beyond this uh, metaphysical kind of aspiration of trying to identify who people really are. We just want to predict how they're going to perform in the future, if they're going to work well with others, and if they're going to fit in with a certain role or organization. Are they being themselves or not is not that relevant. Is there a risk that those you know, let's call them crazy outliers in the organization. I think we're all familiar with those people who don't really fit the prototype um, of the effective, um, the effective manager, the effector employee, um, but they provide a kind of unique value, right? Um, the crazy people in the organization who, who keep things interesting, who come up with wild ideas. Is yeah. there a risk that they'll be selected out? Only if you have a very inflexible, rigid, and unidimensional model for what you're looking for. And even then, you know, if, if companies um, get to a stage where their problem is that they have too many people who are able to perform well, execute for results, get along with others, and are good organizational citizenships who behave with integrity, but they're missing disruptors and innovators, let me tell you, that is really a good problem to have. It is a first world problem, not just for the organization, but also for employees, because it means that a much larger number of people will end up engaged and performing well in their businesses. Having said that, it doesn't need to get to the point where that even happens, because all it would take is, again, for organizations to um, focus on the team level composition and to not just have a lot of people who are 
uh, good at hitting results and performing today, but also, uh, let's say, a large enough number of people who are maybe moderate misfits, you know, who don't fit perfectly in with the culture and can add innovation and disruption without disrupting themselves, which is what would happen if they're a total misfit. Um, it's a question about the gig economy. Um, does the rise of the gig economy uh, in any way actually make some of these tools less important, right? In, in it, some of us have the sense that in organizations, relationships between the organization and talent are becoming more transactional. And so are these tools actually going to be potentially less useful if, if the gig economy continues to rise? I think, first of all, we need to understand that the gig economy is uh, much, much smaller than uh, the media suggests. You know, we, it gets a lot of attention and we all love to stay in Airbnb and take Uber and talk about these um, apps and services and multi-platform kind of uh, multi-sided platform models, some of which are not even um, peer to peer and consumer to consumer, but are actual companies, you know, like in the case of Uber. But I think you know, first let's understand that it's a it's a fraction of the overall GDP or the overall economy anywhere, including in the US. But secondly, I think on the contrary, if a larger number of people than before need to make decisions on whom they engage with uh, for a short term or even long term basis, like if you want to understand who you hire through TaskRabbit or what Uber driver you pick or whose Airbnb you stay at, you need to have some kind of reputational metrics, some kind of trustworthy score or indicator of whether the other person that you're engaging with, and it's the same for them with you, should be trusted. And that means trying to predict their performance. Are they gonna let me down or not? Am I gonna get a good service or not? So in a way, this makes the case for more ubiquitous assessment tools, or at least, more ubiquitous data that tells us about people's potential and their talent because potential is ultimately a data point that enables us to make a bet on an individual based on what our estimate of their future performance is or might be thank you i think we have time for um one more question or two depending how long um we, we go on this one are there particular types of capabilities that organizations need to acquire to make effective use of these new tools or can they be used by anyone without special skills as the tools uh, advance evolve and become uh, slicker and more user friendly the level of expertise required in house goes down but if uh, you know today organizations have hr professionals that aren't at least somewhat data driven and somewhat uh, switched on with technology then it's going to be very difficult to adopt them Mm -hmm. it, it, given what we know about human tuition, um, it's easy for, for people whose organizations seem to them to be atypical to say, well, these tools sound great for, you know, at, for, for a company that's going to hire at a mass scale, everyone doing the same job, but my organization is different. Is there any legitimacy to that point of view? Are there particular circumstances where you would say maybe these tools aren't the right thing? Well, you know, organizations are just like individuals. They all think they are extremely unique and different from everyone else, you know, so they are all unique, just like everyone else. At, this, at the same time, there are core indicators of talent and potential, people's uh, motivation, their learning ability or learnability, and their people skills, and those things will always matter. So maybe 80% of talent and potential is generic, and then 20% pertains to the specific characteristics of the organization and its culture. People and organizations tend to think it's the other way around, and so they end up overcomplicating things and reinventing the wheel, when in fact focusing on fundamental drivers of employability and career success will pay off more. 
Thomas, thanks so much. That will wrap up our Q&A session. Uh, our, to our audience, thank you for the fantastic questions, and sorry we could not get to all of them. Over the next few days, please look for a feedback survey that we'll send by email. We greatly appreciate your thoughts and opinions. And a reminder that a recording of this program will be available within the next three to four business days. That concludes our program. Thank you for attending. Thank you to our presenter, Tomas Chamuro-Prenzik, and to our sponsor, SAS. Have a good day, everyone.